Hi, welcome back. Now it feels like we're living in particularly unsettled times, right? Markets are volatile, stocks go up, stocks go down. And that's always going to be true. Markets are never quite settled because there's always something on the horizon that's putting them off balance. That said though, in most time periods, what's uh, uh, over the horizon tends to be relatively small given the size of the market and tends to be both up and down. Well, we're not in one of those settled time periods right now, are we? What's around the, uh, what's over the horizon that people are most scared about is inflation and the potential movements from it are huge. And for the most part, for the last few weeks, we've seen more down movements and up movements. In this session, I'd like to talk a little bit more about inflation and talk a little bit about the mythology around inflation, how it plays out in investing and particularly focus on the effects it has on stock markets values and where we might be going next. So let's start with a little bit of history. In this graph, you can actually see four measures of inflation, at least in the US, going back in time to 1950. You've got the consumer price index in both its unadjusted form and with seasonal adjustments. You've got the producer price index and you've got the, the GDP deflator. All four are legitimate measures of inflation with differences in how they're computed. So they don't always move, uh, not move in the same ways, but they tend to move together. And if you look at every single measure of inflation, you see what, what happened in the last decade is unusual. To give you a sense of how unusual the 2011 through 2020 decade was, let me just compare it to the decades, the seven decades from the 1950 through 2020. The last decade, 2011 to 20, had the lowest inflation rate using any measure of inflation of all seven decades. In addition, it had one of the lowest volatilities or variances in inflation on, an, on a year-to-year -year basis. So inflation was low and it became stable between 2011 and 20. In fact, the only other period would stay with, with inflation that was as stable at, as the last decade was 1991 to 2000. Those were actually two of the best decades for stocks, so maybe that has something to do with how we think about inflation. So that's actually a good place to start thinking about inflation because the history of inflation is basically that inflation has gone up and down, but the last decade we saw unusually low inflation, unusually stable inflation. So to set this discussion up, I'm going to draw a distinction between expected inflation and unexpected inflation. It's something I've talked about before in my posts on inflation, but I want to talk about it more explicitly. So investors form expectations of inflation. What do they base these expectations on in the past? What they think will happen in, in what they see happening around them. So inflation expectations get set. Those inflation expectations get built into financial assets. With, with corporate bonds and treasury bonds, they get built into the interest rates you charge in these bonds because you want to get an interest rate that's higher than inflation. Sometimes you might settle for less, but clearly inflation is a key player in the interest rates you charge. With stocks, a little messier because inflation plays out both in your earnings because some companies might benefit when inflation goes up and others might not, and in the required returns you charge for these stocks. So investors form expectations they get built into stock prices, bond prices, the prices of any financial asset. Then actual inflation arrives. And one of three things will be true. Either that actual inflation comes in pretty close to expected inflation, or it can come in higher than expected or lower than expected. If inflation is higher than expected, you now have to go back and reprice your financial assets. Why? Because if inflation comes in higher than expected, it might change your expectations for the future. And if inflation in the future is expected to be higher, you've got to push down the prices of bonds to reflect the fact that those bonds are now less valuable to you. Because the interest rates or the coupon rates on those bonds were set in lower inflation periods. With stocks, again, the effect on inflation is a little messier, but you've got to play out how the higher inflation will play out in the cash flows and the discount rates. And if discount rates on stocks go up more than the cash flows are benefiting, stock prices will go down. So in general, when inflation is higher than expected, you're going to mark down financial asset prices. If inflation is lower than expected, the reverse happens. Bond prices and stock prices will tend to be marked up. But that is the dynamic between expected and unexpected inflation. Now, the reason I emphasize this is often when we talk about inflation, we talk about it as one number. We act like 10% inflation is 10% inflation, but what if it's 6% expected and 4% unexpected? 
as opposed to 14% expected minus 4%, no, inflation being lower than expected. In other words, when we talk about inflation, it behooves us to break inflation down into expected and unexpected terms. So let's think about what it is that made the 1970s so deadly, because people old enough to remember, remember this as the deadliest decade from the perspective of how inflation played out in financial assets. First, in the 1970s, inflation did go up. But it's with the benefit of hindsight that we act like everybody knew in the 70s that inflation was going to be high. As we entered the decade, investors had no reason to expect that the 1970s were going to be any different from the 60s. So when inflation first started to show up, they looked for reasons to, to uh, something to blame, some reason why the inflation was there that they thought would go away. Sound familiar? It was oil prices, it was OPEC, and then as inflation continued, people had to reassess expectations. And through the 70s, here's what we saw. It was not just that inflation was high, but that expected inflation constantly ran behind actual inflation. So the surprises you kept getting on inflation were always negative. They were higher than expected. And as you can see, that's not great for financial assets. Now, leading into 2021, let's face it. We've been spoiled. We've been spoiled by a decade of low and stable inflation. In fact, there are many people in this market who've never known a market without stable and low inflation. So when inflation came back early in 2021, like all human beings, we looked for a reason it would go away. That was transient. Initially, we said it's a COVID comeback, from the coming back from the COVID shutdown. Then we said it was supply chains, and then it was Russia. We kept looking for reasons that inflation would be transient. But as the year went on and we went into 2022 and inflation continued to be high and actually got higher, those reasons start to lose their resonance. So I think now at least people are willing to accept that inflation is now higher than it was pre-2021. And we can ask why that, you know, that might have happened, but it's here to stay. So let's talk about how as inflation has become more embedded, expected inflation numbers have gone up. Remember, it took the, a while in the 70s for actual inflation to pay out and expected inflation. The same story seems to have reflected, seems to have occurred in this decade as well. Initially, people looked at inflation and said, it's going to go away. Now that it's here to stay, how have expectations changed? I've used two measures of expected inflation here to illustrate how that shift has happened. The first comes from a University of Michigan survey of consumers where they ask them what the, what the expected inflation that they see in the future is. That number is now up to 5.4%. Incidentally, that's the highest value we've seen on that survey since the 1980s. Clearly, consumers are getting more wary about inflation and starting to build into expectations. Financial markets also give you a signal about, in, uh, about inflation, and you can get that signal most clearly in the U.S. Treasury market. In this graph that you see to the right, I have the 10-year T-bond rate, which is you know, obviously one of the most traded bonds in the world, and I also have the rate on the 10-year TIPS, the inflation-protected Treasury bonds. They're both 10-year bonds. One is inflation-protected and the other isn't. The difference between those two rates is actually a measure of expected inflation. Just to give you a sense of what that number looked like at the, at, on May 5th of 2022 when I was doing this post, that difference was 2.85%. The T-bond rate was about 3.03%. The, um, the, the, the TIPS rate was 0.18%. The difference was 2.85%. That is also a high, though not much, that much higher than previous highs, but it's taken a while. So it looks like consumers are expecting 5.4% and what investors seem to be building into the T-bond is about, about a 2.85% difference. You say, why the difference? One reason is simple. The consumer survey, survey asks about inflation in the near term. What will inflation be next year? What you're getting out of the treasury market is a long-term inflation. So short-term versus long-term, that might explain some of the difference. Second is maybe consumers are over-adjusting. Think of the items that have shown the most inflation in the last year or two. Gas, food. These are items that consumers run into a daily basis and maybe that's coloring their expectations. So maybe consumers are over adjusting to last year's or last period's inflation. Or, and this could be true as well, maybe markets are slow to adjust. Why? Because you've spent a decade with low inflation, it's tough to let go. 
Maybe it's coming from the fact that, um, that, that people are still looking for reasons why they think inflation will go away. And it might also be partly driven by this belief that the central banks can keep inflation low if they choose to. Whatever the reason, whatever the measure we're using, actual inflation is up, expected inflation is up. And that has consequences. Let's look at the most direct consequence. As expected inflation has risen, interest rates have gone up. This is actually the U.S. Treasury yield curve. And just for comparison, take a look at what it looked like at the start of 2022. That was only four months ago and today. At the start of 22, at the very low end of the spectrum, one month, two month, three month, six month tables, the rate was close to 0%. And the 10-year bond rate was 1.5%. And the yield curve was upward sloping. So the 30-year rate was higher than the 20-year rate, which was higher than the 10-year rate. That was the start of 2022. What's different as of May 5th of 2022? First, short-term rates have risen. The one-month table rate is now up to a half a percent. That's a half a percent move over the last four months. And if you look at the 10-year rate, it's now close to 3%. It breached 3% briefly last week. And if you look at the 10 to 30-year portion of the curve, it's flattened out. So the 10-year, the 20-year, and the 30-year rates all are at about 3%. The yield curve has shifted fairly significantly over the last four months, and I think the prime culprit is inflation. I know you're saying, but what about the Fed? For those who think that it's a Fed's saber rattling about the Fed funds rate that's doing it, remember, rates started rising well before the Fed opened its mouth. In this case, as I look at when the rates started changing and when the Fed started speaking about you know, 50 basis point increase in rates, it looks like markets are leading the Fed, not the other way around. But clearly, there's been an effect on interest rates. Now, as rates have gone up, people have seemed to reassess the, their views on risk and the price of risk in markets. Let's again start with the market where it's easiest to observe, which is the corporate bond market. You can observe the price of risk there in a corporate bond default spread. When people become more wary about risk and price it higher, default spreads widen. This is a graph of default spreads on bonds in different rating classes ranging from AAA down to C and below. Now, across the board, default spreads have gone up. They've gone up more for the riskiest bonds than for the, for the safest bonds, but across the board, the spreads are wide. Again, you might say, what's the Fed's doing? Remember, much, or, or some of you might say it's Russia that's doing it. Much of this increase in spreads happened well before the Fed spoke up and well before Russia invaded Ukraine. So clearly, the price of risk has been an upward march. And again, I think the culprit is fears about inflation. Finally, with stocks, it's a little more difficult to assess the price of risk, but I do try at the start of every month to estimate an implied expected return in stocks, where I take the stock, the index, the S&P 500, and I look at what rate of return the, you, know, you would need to get the present value of cash flows to be equal to the level of the index. In other words, I'm looking at the rate of return implied in the stock price. At the start of this year, the expected return on stocks, given how stocks were priced then, was 5.75%. The T-bond rate was 1.51%, yielding an equity risk premium of 4.24%. So at the start of the year, expected returns in U.S. stocks were close to all-time lows. That expected return at the start of May 2022 breached 8% for the first time in three years. Stocks are now priced to earn more than 8%, and the increase is coming from both places. First, the T-bond rate is much higher, 1.51 up to close to 3%, 2.89%. And the equity risk premium has also risen. Again, I think inflation is to blame. Inflation obviously plays out in the T-bond rate, but it's also pushing up risk premium. You're saying why? History suggests that the uncertainty about inflation seems to increase with the level of inflation. In other words, when inflation is 2%, it goes with less uncertainty about inflation than when inflation is 10%, and that seems to be playing out in risk premiums. Interest rates have shifted, equity risk premiums have gone up, and along the way, there seems to be much, a much greater acceptance that we might be heading for a recession. I've noticed a lot more recession talk in the last two to four weeks. A few weeks ago, Larry Summers and Alec Domash actually authored a paper where they argued there was a 100% chance of a recession based upon two indicators, 
that inflation was greater than 5% and the unemployment rate was lower than 4%. And they pointed to the fact that if you go back all the way to the 1950s, there has never been a combination of inflation being greater than 5% and unemployment less than 4%, where there hasn't been a recession between 12 and 24 months. I don't have the certitude that they do, and I don't believe that you can use past rules of thumb that simply. But I think we could all agree that there's more talk about a recession now and more fear of one now than we had four weeks ago, eight weeks ago, 12 weeks ago, and definitely at the start of the year. So let's think about the investment consequences of higher inflation, perhaps higher interest rates, effects on economic growth. Everything is in motion. At the start of um, at, at the close of trading on May fifth, twenty twenty two, the S and P five hundred was at forty one forty seven. It's down about thirteen point three percent just this year. It's been a bad year for stocks, and of course, we listen to expert advice. It's all over the map. There are some who are arguing that the worst is yet to come; that we should sell all our stocks. At the other end, there are some who are arguing that this is the time to buy because stocks have overcorrected. Rather than give you a decisive answer, I'm going to present you with a framework that you can use to decide for yourself what to do next. To understand this framework, I'm going to go to the three drivers of what I think determine where stock prices should be now. First is where you think T-bond rates are headed. Clearly this year has been an upward move, 1.5 to 3%. But at this point, you can take one of three views. One is that the big move is behind us. They're going to settle in around 3%. The second is there's more pain to come. Inflation is going to continue to run ahead of expectations. Interest rates are going to get pushed up. The T-bond rates are going to rise. And the third is that now either because of a recession or because inflation is transient, T-bond rates are going to come down. So what do you think will happen to steady state interest rates? Second is what do you think about equity risk premiums? At 5.24% at the start of May 2022, that number is at the high end of the historical spectrum. That said, though, all three possibilities remain open. Maybe we will continue to see that equity risk premium rise. Remember, the last time we had 6.5% equity risk premiums for an extended period was in 1978, when inflation fears were at their worst. So maybe that's one possibility. The second is that we will stay at 5.24% elevated because there's risk, but no, we built it in pretty much. And the third is that it'll drop back as inflation you know, is transient and goes away, that risk premiums will drop back to 4.2 or 4.3%. Finally, the earnings numbers that we're seeing for the S&P 500 reflect the fact that we've had fairly strong economic growth in the U.S. in the last year and a half. So earnings are up, estimates reflect that. So far at least, the fears of recessions don't seem to have shown up in the earnings estimates and I updated them last week. That could suggest either that analysts <clears throat> who estimate earnings for the S&P 500 don't believe that there's going to be a recession or believe if there's a recession, it's going to be a mild one or they're in denial. So there again, you can make judgment calls about what earnings will look like, that the estimates are going to come in pretty much as expected, that they're going to be lower than expected, and if they're lower than expected, that, of course, is going to affect the value of the index. So I'm going to start with what I call a status quo valuation. What's a status quo valuation? It reflects what I think the consensus view that seems to be built into stocks right now, which is, first, the T-bond rates have settled in. 3% is where they are. That's where they'll end up. That the equity risk, remember, 5.24% is you know, it's higher than history, but you know we'll, we'll pretty much settle with that. And that earnings estimates are not going to be affected, at least long term, by whatever happens to the economy near term. If you bring those projections in, you get surprisingly close to the level of the index rate. You're within 1%. So if you ask me, what are the markets doing right now? They seem to be assuming that the, that the big moves in each of these is behind them. And the consensus view basically, and that should come as no surprise because when you look at the overall market, it does reflect the consensus view. Now that said though, there's more divergence now on each of these variables than probably any time over the last decade. On interest rates, far more disagreement about where we're going. On earnings, far more disagreement about whether the consensus can be maintained. On equity risk premiums, same divergence. So what I did was I actually decided to look at what the index would look like using various combinations of risk-free rates and equity risk premiums. So the way to read this is if you have a risk-free rate of 3%, an equity risk premium of 5%, 3 plus 5 is 8%, you're pricing stocks to deliver 
I've also looked at three earnings scenarios. The first is that earnings come in roughly close to the existing estimates, that they're 10% below or 20% below. 10% would be a, a, a recession, a, a, a normal recession. 20% would be a severe recession. So in a sense, I've captured the effects of different outcomes here. And you can see that the values I get range the spectrum. Now, of course, I'm not trying to cop out here, but I'm going to present four possible scenarios that could play out here. The first is what I'm going to call much ado about nothing. So in this scenario, people believe that we're making too much of inflation, that inflation is in fact transient, that it's going to go away. And if you truly believe that, then you should really be buying stocks because then equity risk premium should drop back down from 5.24% to 5 or even 4%. Risk-free rates may even decline because if inflation is only 1%, why should risk-free rates stay at 3%? So you'll have lower risk-free rates, lower risk premiums, and as you can see, the index could be undervalued by 30 40%. So think of that as the most benign scenario. The most malignant scenario, of course, is what I'm going to call my 70s show. In other words, we return to what we had in the 70s, which is a combination of high inflation and recession. In other words, inflation stays high, the economy goes into a recession, but inflation continues to be high. Then we're entering potentially doomsday territory. Inflation stays high, interest rates are going to go up, recession hits, earnings are going to decline. And if people get scared, which they will with high inflation and a bad economy, equity risk rates can converge on 6% or higher. You could say a 50% haircut in stocks under that catastrophic scenario. There's a middle ground here, which I'll call the return of Volcker. Paul Volcker, as many of you know, was the Fed chair in the late 70s, was given the task of breaking the back of inflation. And he succeeded. He became a legend by succeeding, but it was at a significant cost. He drove the U.S. economy into a severe recession, which lasted almost three years, and in the process was able to deliver lower inflation. So in the return of Volcker, inflation does come down, so do interest rates as inflation comes down. But it comes at a with a cost, which is earnings are badly damaged, 15-20% drop in earnings, and equity risk premiums might in fact increase. It's, of course, less dangerous than the 70s rerun, but you can see that there's going to be pain along the way in the Volcker rerun. There's a fourth final scenario, which is that, remember, the Volcker scenario is no politician will like that scenario because you'll be running for election when people have lost their jobs. So there will be a push to not take those drastic actions that might be needed to break the back of inflation. So the fourth scenario, which I say live and let live with inflation, you, we all decide that 5% inflation is not so bad, that we can live with it. And in that scenario, you'll have higher interest rates Maybe earnings will come in as estimated because without the recession, you don't have the earnings damage, but you will still see a markdown and how much of a markdown will depend on how much higher risk premiums will be with that higher inflation. Remember, historically, higher inflation has gone with higher risk premiums. Now, I will not prejudge for you where you should end up, but you can see already why there are so many divergent perspectives in the market. And you have to decide where you want to put yourself in this table. That said, though, if inflation stays high and continues to be high, we have another choice to make, which is that if inflation stays high, no matter which scenario unfolds, financial assets are going to be damaged, stocks and bonds. And you've got to think about other investment classes. If you go back to the 1970s, the big beneficiaries of high inflation were gold and real estate. I do think that real estate we've damaged as an inflation hedge by securitizing. Because it turns out that securitizing an asset class makes it behave more like a financial asset. But I do think there are segments of real estate, maybe rental properties where you can raise rental income at the rate of inflation, could still hold on as partial inflation edges. Gold, you've got to pay respect to. I mean, this is an asset that's been around longer than any currency, and it's held its value through every crisis and through inflation. It's not going to make you rich, but it might preserve your wealth. The big question, of course, is about the new investment classes, cryptos and NFTs that have shown up in the last decade, whether they could, in fact, be the next generation's gold. 
Now, that's a couple of things that, that might give you pause. The first is they haven't been around for that long. So making judgments about them is a little tricky because let's face it, over the last few, over, the, over time, there have been other collectibles that have been presented as alternatives to gold. I want, don't want to be facetious, but you can think Beanie Babies, Pokemon cards, baseball cards, and they have a check at history. I mean, many of them start off, you pay high prices thinking they'll preserve the value, and 20 years later, you've got an attic full of Beanie Babies that nobody will buy from you. The second is, we have some history for these cryptos and NFTs. And that history has not been a good one for them if you think of them as collectibles. A good collectible holds its value or even goes up when financial assets are collapsing. And if you look at 2020 and you look at the most recent collapse in stocks, what you're discovering is that cryptos and NFTs are not behaving like collectibles, they're behaving like very risky stocks. So I think that if inflation returns and stays high, we're going to get the, uh, the acid test for cryptos and NFTs. We're going to discover whether the millennial gold or millennial beanie babies, and we'll find out soon enough. So in conclusion, here's what I'd like to say. The inflation genie is out of the bottle. It's undeniable now it's out of the bottle. And if history is any guide, getting it back in is not going to be quick and it's not going to be painless. Now, it's a lesson we learned in the 1970s and other countries have learned through their own bouts with inflation that kind of tailored how we thought about inflation for much of the last four decades. So it's the reason I think when inflation showed up in early 2021, I expected the Fed to act quickly and the administration to take it seriously. For whatever reason, and I can understand where they were coming from because I think they learned the wrong lessons from 2010. I think they chose to ignore it. They chose to you know, argue that it's transient with the presumption that they would get in control if it was needed. And I think in the process, they've now put us between, um, so they indulge in happy talk, you know, everything is transitional, it'll take care of itself. But now they find themselves between a rock and a hard place. The rock being higher inflation long term, and the hard place being a recession, perhaps even a severe one. Now, if you're tempted to say, I told you so, be careful, because we're all in that space between a rock and a hard place with the Fed and the administration. So there's pain, we're all going to feel it. So I wish we weren't at this moment, but it is where we are. And as investors, we've got to factor in the reality that the rest of the year, we're going to be dealing with inflation. It is going to be the lead story for what happens to markets. And I you know I think we need to be ready to be flexible and adaptable as news comes out as to where in that very wide range of scenarios we will end up. I thank you very much for listening and I wish you the best. Take care.